Hi there, I'm the MythKeeper. Welcome back to my channel, the best place on the internet for Pathfinder lore and history. If you like this kind of content, be sure to like and subscribe. And if there's anything you'd like me to talk about in particular, let me know in the comments below as I do read all the comments. This week, we're going back to my religion series, and I'm talking about a unique outsider race, uh, a little bit different from all the other ones that we've talked about so far. So in the past, I've only talked about outsiders that reside in the Outer Plains, which is the destination that your souls go to after you've been judged. But this unique race of outsiders, very strange outsiders, live in the realm of shadow. And we're going to talk a little bit about their history and how they ended up there. I'm talking about the Velstrax, uh, the creature type that is unique to Pathfinder that evolved from the Chitons of D&D. Really cool creature type. Enjoy. I recently rounded out my series on the fiendish demigods of the Outer Plains with a video I recently did on the Azura, the Divs, and the Clipoths. That video was preceded by a video on the Devils of Hell, a video on the Demons of Abaddon, and finally a video on the Demons of the Abyss. However, as it turns out, the three evil-aligned outer planes, Hell, Abaddon, and the Abyss, are not the only places in the Great Beyond that fiendish entities reside. The most common place for fiends to reside outside of the evil outer planes is the Prime Material Plane. Firstly, many of the fiends I've already discussed, like devils and demons, can be found in the Material Plane either because there is value in the conquest of material plane worlds, or to guarantee souls entry into the evil outer planes, or because they are serving some other similarly nefarious purpose. But this is also because there are a few fiendish types that have made the material plane their primary home. These include the demon-like spirit creatures known as the Oni, the shape-shifting evil entities known as the Raksasha, and the titan-spawned fiends known as the Demodans. The material plane is also not the only place where other breeds of fiends exist. The Sakils, for example, are fiendish types that can be found in the ethereal plane. The Velstrax, on the other hand, dwell in the material universe's dark counterpart, the Plane of Shadow. Over the next few months, I will intermittently take a deeper look at these five additional fiendish types, as they too can ascend to the power of lesser divinities, and they too have worshippers on Galarian. I'm going to start with the Velstrax, who have some of the most interesting history of any of the fiends of Galarian and are immediately recognizable as these disturbing creatures are driven by strange instincts to achieve incredible levels of pain and pleasure, resulting in them performatively showcasing disturbing forms of self-harm. The Velstrax did not originate in the Plane of Shadow. They were the original denizens of Hell once. But to understand how they ended up where they are today, we need to take a quick look at the history of the Velstrax. During the Age of Creation, not long after the Elder Gods abandoned the First World and began work on the construction of the Prime Material Universe, the outer plane known as Hell was largely uninhabited. In this time, the Gods formed the Titans from the raw substance of the planes to help them refine and develop the new and still roughly forming multiverse. For unknown reasons, the Titans rebelled against their progenitors, declaring themselves the true lords of creation. Entire planes were destroyed in the ensuing war, but in the end, the gods emerged victorious, banishing their rebellious children to the evil plains. While many of the banished titans, thereafter known as the Thanatotic Titans, ended up in Abaddon or in the Abyss, some settled in Hell. They and their Gigas offspring, the Hell Gigas, may have been the first permanent residents of that plain. A little after this, it is likely the second entity to make a home for itself was the evil dragon god Dahak and you can see my Dragon's Creature feature video for more details on how Dahak came to reside there. It is also possible Dahak preceded the Titans. The exact sequencing of events in the Age of Creation is not always clear to planar scholars. Then, in the material universe, the planets began to cool, and the first life began to emerge. With this life came the first judged souls. In the Abyss, the souls of selfish, deceitful, and cruel mortals coalesced into slug-like larvae. In Abaddon, the souls of predatory and violent individuals found themselves competing for survival in the endless blackened wasteland, eventually transforming into the first demons of the Outer Plains. Hell, however, the least populous of the three evil Outer Plains, did not receive full souls in this time. However, the decadent and depraved thoughts of the powerful primordial peoples coalesced into new post-mortal life forms. These were the first Velstrax, formed of decadence and pride, long before the first devils arrived in Hell. Not long after the Velstrax emerged in Hell, some divine accident or misdeed introduced another post-mortal lifeform to Hell, the Azuras, whom I discussed already in my previous video. The Age of Creation was vast, and it unfolded ever so slowly by the standards of the later ages. 
For untold millennia, the plain of hell would have been the domain of Dahak, the Helgiges, the Azuras, and the Velstrax. Then something important and unexpected occurred in the plane of heaven. As life on the material universe grew in sophistication and complexity, two of the elder gods, brothers by most accounts, had a great disagreement over the nature of souls. Their names were Asmodeus and Ehis. The conflict between Asmodeus and Ehis led to a war in heaven that culminated with the death of Ehis. The Chronicles of Heaven refer to this event as Asmodeus' fall, whereas the infernal sources tend to refer to the ensuing exodus as a kind of self-imposed exile. Regardless, by the time Asmodeus abandoned or was rejected from heaven, he had already become aware of hell. During his travels across the great beyond, Asmodeus had discovered this realm, and it is said he perceived it to be like unto the shadow of heaven, and he explored it for an age. So he learnt much about its people, the Gigas, the Velstrax, the Azuras, and chief among the last of these, the Azura Rana named Geryon, that presented itself to him as a great serpent in the ruins of a temple. During his fall, Asmodeus was not alone. He was a charismatic elder god, and his followers were many, including his protege Balzabul, his creation Belial, and his lieutenants Moloch, Despater, and Nibus. He led them all to hell, promising a place that could be moulded into their own image. Asmodeus' army was not welcomed into hell. When Asmodeus and his exiles from heaven came to hell and seized the ancient city of Dis from the Velstraks, the greatest among hell's native denizens, including the Velstrak demagogues, the Azura Ramas, and the Gigas warlords, all gathered in council, intent on uniting their armies against Asmodeus. Of the native denizens, only Dahak remained out of the conflict, believing accurately that even the elder god Asmodeus would not dare challenge for the dragon god's peace of hell. The lords of hell outnumbered Asmodeus and his exiles, and it's possible that Asmodeus might have been defeated and pushed out of hell to find a domain elsewhere, but they were ultimately betrayed by one of their own. The Azura Rana Geryon, who turned on the other Azura at a critical moment, devouring, according to scripture, no fewer than 812 of the former tyrants of hell. After Asmodeus' victory, Asmodeus, his exiles, and the betrayer Geryon became the first of a new form of fiendish life, the devils of hell. The devils made the defeated Gigas into their servitors. They pushed the Azura Ramas and their brethren to the furthest reaches of the plains. But for the Velstrax, they reserved the greatest horror of all. Asmodeus was said to have found these creatures so hideous that he had them chained in the pit of hell. The Velstrak demagogue Agragus, among the most powerful of his kind, eventually escaped his bondage and released the other Velstrak demagogues and the rest of their kindred, and he led his people in exile from hell to the Plain of Shadow. Indeed, Velstraks have continued to inhabit the Shadow Plain to this day. The nine Velstrak demagogues are the demigod rulers of the Velstrak race, each one a master of a vast domain on the Shadow Plain, ruling from cities built of living flesh and bone. Later, but still in the Age of Creation, another of Heaven's ancient deities had a fall from grace of his own. The god Dubral delved too deeply into the void, and became corrupted as the sinister god Zon Kuthon. This deity made his home in the Plain of Shadow as well, creating for himself a vast domain there known as the Shadowed Land of Zove Cain. Many Velstraks work for Zon Kuthon, the god of darkness, pain, and suffering, and live in his domain of Zove Cain. In fact, owing to the association of many of their kind with the Midnight Lord, the faithful of Zon Kuthon regard Velstraks as sacred to their religion. Although they were the original post-mortal life-form of Hell, they are significantly different from the devils that inhabit Asmodeus' new version of Hell. For start, Velstraks themselves consider themselves above the petty concepts of good and evil. Their long torture and confinement in Hell, coupled with the subtle influence of the Plane of Shadow, has made them unique entities. They are sadomasochistic creatures by nature, and engage in their search for the perfect sensation with a passion of scientist artistes, and consider no cost too high for the secrets of the ultimate being. A second distinction between devils and Velstrax is that Velstrax have no monolithic hierarchy. While the most regimented Velstrax are typically the servants of Zon Kuthon, many independent Velstrax cabals function like workshops of artists or artisans. These beings prefer to focus on personal endeavors and rarely gather in huge numbers for conquest. In particular, many Velstrax seek to follow the paths of those known to have had some brush with the sublime. A final curiosity is that despite their history of imprisonment in hell and conflict with the exiles from heaven, Velstrax have ultimately held no grudges against Asmodeus and the devils of hell, largely considering them to be a critical part of their story that set them on the path to perfection that they seek today. 
Contemporary Velstrax have even established an embassy in Dis, called the Embassy of Broken Chains, and can be considered important allies of the devils. Because Velstrax do not reside in the outer planes, they exist outside the ordinary life cycle of the souls. Without outside intervention, Verasma would never consign a soul to the shadow plane, as it's not a correct destination for a judged soul. Therefore, they have had to develop their own unique methods of propagating the species. New Velstrax are therefore formed from the souls of masochistic or sadistic mortals that are diverted into the shadow plane by unknown means, though it's known that many Nidalees end up here, suggesting some arrangement through the god Zon Kuthon. These souls are then forged by the demagogues, the godlike elders of the Velstrax, into forms that suit their vile predilections, ranging from the low-ranking augurs to the aesthetics-obsessed interlocutors. This brings us to my next section, the types of Velstrax. A range from least powerful to most powerful, here are the common types of Velstrax. Augur. Augurs are only about a foot in diameter and weigh 30 pounds. These spherical knots of sinewy muscle, serrated blades, and bloody metal are the most common Velstrax on the Shadow Plane. They are the voyeurs of Velstrax society. Each augur has only a single eye from which they like to witness the horrors inflicted by other Velstrax. Ostiarius. Despite being among the weaker forms of Velstrax, Ostiariuses stand over six feet tall, and individuals range from skeletally thin to bulky or unpleasantly corpulent. Ostiariuses serve as the emissaries of the Velstrax, tending to the portals between the Shadow Plane and the Material Plane. They not only escort other Velstrax into the world of mortals, but also work to entice mortals into the realm of the Velstrax. Among the most pleasant and persuasive of the Velstrax, Ostiariuses are prepared to converse for hours upon any topic, but they are skilled at always returning the subject to their various perverse philosophies. Evangelists. Evangelists are human-sized Velstrax, but the heavy chains they always wear drape their forms, often leading to them weighing 350 pounds or more. Evangelists roam the furthest reaches of the plains to spread the word of their kinds of barned beliefs in the perfection through pain. They are therefore the most frequently encountered Velstrax on the material plane, leading covens of hedonistic mortal flesh sculptors or serving as wardens of horrific dungeons. In regions ruled by infernal powers, evangelists may serve as lieutenants or advisors, whispering secret paths to power in exchange for mortal souls or choice mortal flesh. Sacristans. Sacristans are failures among the Velstrax, creatures whose bodies and minds have been utterly broken by the Velstrax torments. These unfortunates are assembled from scrap metal, nerveless flesh, and bits of darkness into loyal agents who take ecstatic pleasure in serving other Velstrax. Sacristans are empowered by a miniature gateway to the shadow plane deep within their mouths. By distending their jaws, they can howl with the shrieks and windstorms of the shadow plane. Interlocutors. These garish abominations of fused steel and flesh average nine feet tall and weigh approximately 800 pounds. Interlocutors are the most talented surgeon sculptors of the Velstrax, carving away flesh and replacing it with new body parts of muscle, sinew, and metal. Each interlocutor structures their individual appearance carefully, but all are towering, multi-limbed amalgamations of the strongest limbs, the densest bone, and the sharpest metal they can find. They continue to search for new material to graft onto their forms, and their slain foes are rarely found intact, as little is more valuable to interlocutors than a powerful opponent's harvested parts. Ephialtes. An Ephialtes resembles a huge, four-legged fiend bound in chains with a fanged, leech-like maw at the end of a long, wormy neck. Ephialtes are the hunters of the Velstrak kind. They are committed to seeking out prey and quarry for the Shadow Plain, so that lesser Velstraks may hunt them. Some of these will in turn develop into new Ephialtes. They are the preferred entities to summon by evil spellcasters, as they are equally eager to serve mortal summoners as the Lords of Shadow, as long as their work involves murder, abduction, and torture, of course, and they will always offer to dispose of the remains of their victims in the Plain of Shadow. Ephialtes have an even more advanced control of the chains they wear than their lesser kin, and they can breathe forth a mass of barbed, entangling chains. Precentors. Among the most powerful of Velstrak kind are the Precentors, and only a few of these exist at any given time to serve the Velstrak demagogues. They work for these elders as storytellers and historians, recording and recounting events of significance to the demagogue in question. The presence of a precentor is impossible to miss, as each precentor is followed by a terrible choir of screams whenever they approach. Vincuvicar. Despite their own long history with imprisonment, this has never kept the Velstrax from keeping mortal or immortal prisoners of their own. Serving as wardens for these infamous bastions of black stone and wrought iron are the Vincuvicars, 
Velstrax who seem to thrive on depriving others of freedom. Each Vinkuvikar possesses a personal spiked iron throne, a symbol of its authority. If encountered on the material plane, planar experts may know that if a Vinkuvikar symbol is destroyed, then the Velstrak who carries it will be banished back to the plane of shadow. Eremites. Eremites are the oldest and most mutilated Velstraks, second only to the Velstrak demagogues. Eremites average seven feet tall and weigh approximately 200 pounds. These powerful entities roam the plains to seek out ideal portions of other creatures to steal, such as a hero's sword arm or an angel's pinions. Eremites capture these specimens to clinically test their true limits, then harvest specimens and add them to their own bodies. An Eremite might attach tongues to their hands as extra fingers or a fist to the back of their neck in a horrid improvement. The most powerful of the Eremites are the Eremite overlords, elder Velstrax, who are on the cusp of achieving their own form of twisted divinity. The Velstrak Demagogues Agrigus Agrigus stands as perhaps the most ancient and formidable among the Chitin demagogues. His origins stretch back to a time prior to Asmodeus's collusion with the Azuragarian to dominate Hell, and populate it with devilish beings. Following this betrayal, the Velstrax found themselves imprisoned in chains. Few know that it was Agrigus himself who wielded the warhammer that once forged these shackles. Once bound in his own chains, he let out a long and lowly moan. A moan that was overheard by Dolores, an infernal demigoddess that recognized a kinship in Agrigus's unrelenting sadism. It was Dolores also that helped Agrigus free the other demagogues. Then Agrigus led his people out of hell in search of a more suitable abode. He discovered a fitting haven on the shadow plane, where the Velstrax could use the shadows to conceal themselves or mold them into strongholds. There, Agrigus established the twisting and perplexing Abbey of Nevers, a structure where space and direction lose all meaning. Despite its vastness, the Abbey remained sparsely inhabited, echoing emptiness through its labyrinthine halls. Agrigus forsook his corporeal form within the Abbey, merging his essence with his creation. This connection allows him to experience all occurrences within the Abbey simultaneously. On the rare occasion he necessitates a physical presence, Agrigus animates an enormous suit of ebony armor, complemented by the same warhammer that accompanied him out of hell. While other demagogues have made peace with their past, his primary focus within the Abbey of Nevers remains vengeance against Garion, Asmodeus, and the host of devils that supplanted the Velstrax. Those who enter the Abbey fall prey to an overwhelming desire for revenge, compelled to devise torturous retributions for past slights. Agrigus thrives on these emotions of hatred and retribution. While few cults revere him for extended periods due to internal strife, he does lend an ear to individuals consumed by the thirst for revenge. Baravoclare. Baravoclare's physical form mirrors her central preoccupation, an image of a reclined body on a black slab, frozen in the moment of its final breath. This transition from life to death extends indefinitely, as a dark shadow attempts to coalesce into a semi-tangible form, capturing that ultimate exhalation. Baravoclare's long-standing interest in the annihilation of souls across the outer planes has crystallized around the profusion of life on the material plane, the spectacle of countless beings dying, with only few achieving profound insight as they pass, compelled her to refine the precise instant of death. Her followers, guided by her teachings, work to control and enhance these final moments. While some covertly serve as medical practitioners, others toil in vast flesh factories, cultivating victims in grim conditions solely for the purpose of studying their dying moments. Cult members anticipate their own end as a contribution to the demagogue, securing their immortality within Baravoclair's domain, the shadowy kingdom of Everbreath. Faris. Faris takes on the appearance of a tall, slender human with exaggerated features, garbed in an immaculate white surgical smock. Wielding a broad-bladed axe with the finesse of a scalpel, Faris fixates on closely scrutinizing flesh to unveil divine universal truths. His attention centers on uncovering psychic connections between murderers and their victims. His cult diverges into two distinct factions, taxidermists who labor to preserve unique anatomical specimens, and anatomists, fanatics who spin increasingly far-fetched conspiracy theories surrounding the sanctity of slaughter. Both sects seek meaning and reason within flayed skin and preserved tissue samples. Ferris's sanctuary, Alisthelia, takes the form of a sprawling hospital with towering spires. Within its confines, cultists conduct surgeries on captives abducted from various planes, conserving distinctive portions of their bodies. The halls resonate with screams, owing to the frequent amputations and mutilations performed. Incariax. 
In Cariax, a colossal humanoid encrusted with ice and standing at seventy feet tall, bears bloody icicles piercing through his flesh and his stitched shut lips. In Cariax communicates wordlessly, through expressive gazes that convey curiosity or displeasure. Unsettled by the transience of perfection, in Cariax aspires to immortalize forms of horrific art, ranging from idealized screams to intricate tortures in eternal ice. Commanding control over ice and snow, he can solidify victims into ice with a mere thought. His realm, the Frozen Tears, is a landscape atop an icy sea, and shrouded in a blizzard of razor-sharp crystals. At its core lies White Death's diadem, where in Cariax safeguards his most valuable treasures and his formidable allies. The uppermost echelons are exclusively reserved for the demagogue and his most abominable creations. In Cariax's enduring link to the infernal demigoddess Dolores is particularly deep, beyond the gratitude other Velstrax feel they owe her for their liberation from hell. The demigoddess's visit inspired the name of his realm, an homage to her gift of frozen tears. Incariax fashioned much of his realm to honor Dolores and strives to win her continued favor. Cacaiton. Cacaiton emerges as an exceptional demagogue, who ascended not from hell, but from Galarian's ancient days as a human. Cacaiton is so renowned that the latter part of her name, Chiton, has been used throughout Galarian's history as an alternative name for Velstrax. In life, she earned her notoriety as a ruthless warchief in Garand. Though frequently linked to the city-state of Kagalko, which she established as a Velstrak in the Age of Darkness, it remains unclear whether Kagalko was her mortal birthplace or an area that piqued her interest after her ascension. However, the enigmatic residents of modern Kagalko, marked by hollow eyes and stitched lips, remain silent on the matter. Kakaiton's legacy is marked by her unwavering leadership. She pledged to aid her people who suffered under the perpetual darkness of Earthfall. This quest led her to the Plain of Shadow, where she encountered the Velstrax and their perverse arts. She shared the knowledge of fortifying strong flesh to frail bodies with her followers. The tortures she devised, imposed on both willing and unwilling subjects, reverberate through the bleak terrain known as the Choir Veils today, flanked by the chitin lace's jagged ridges. Renowned for her fervor in embracing Velstrak teachings and her masterful skill in stitching flesh, her transformations of agony and exaltation captivated Evangelist Velstrax. Her journey culminated when she applied these methods to herself, propelling her to the ranks of the Velstrak demagogues. Moraban. Unlike most Velstrak strive to perfect themselves, Moraban pursues perfection in others. Embedding a minuscule latent spore of his essence into each flawless creature, Moraban becomes an integral part of the perfection it shapes. By distributing its essence among perfected beings across the plains, Moraban guarantees its survival in the face of any catastrophe. Moraban's devotees traverse various worlds to locate individuals who epitomize excellence, be it in athleticism, genius, predation, or other forms. As few creatures inherently meet these demanding standards, the cult resorts to surgical enhancements, alchemical infusions, and forced breeding to cultivate perfection. Once a peerless specimen emerges, the cult conducts a ritual to implant a fragment of Moraban from the Plane of Shadow. This procedure often inflicts pain or trauma on the host, as Moraban's alien memories and urges forever intertwine with their thoughts. Yet these sacrifices ensure Moraban's perpetual existence, Upon the host's demise, a portion of Moraban's consciousness returns to the Shadow Plane, carrying with it a copy of the host's biological composition, contributing to the overall enhancement of the demagogue. Rator Gash Rator Gash, driven by a conviction that planes and their inhabitants are inescapably erratic, seeks to assess the constancy of superior attributes across generations. Creatures displaying promise, be it in strength, beauty, or intellect, often fail to pass these qualities to their descendants. Rater Gash's solution lies in examining bones. Her domain, Targothieth, sprawls as an unending charnel expanse, emanating into a towering bone tower that governs the landscape. Velstrax within Targothieth scour the material plane for remarkable skulls, extending their reach through the roots that connect the different worlds. Cultists of Rater Gash establish branches on various worlds, searching for potent creatures whose skulls they can present for evaluation. Ratergash scrutinizes the skulls, cherishing those embodying potential perfection while discarding those she deems lacking. Sugros. Among the Velstrax, the pursuit of perfection through elimination of imperfection is well known. Sugros, however, has taken this philosophy to an unprecedented extreme within the ranks of her kin. 
Over countless millennia, she has concentrated on a peculiar diet of vanity and arrogance, expertly extracting these traits from others and incorporating them into her own skin. Liberated from the confines of traditional flesh and bone, Sugros fervently preaches the pleasures of breath, thought, and voice. She imparts to her followers that all that is essential are lips capable of expressing ecstasy or torment, and a mind adept at interpreting both pain and pleasure. Sugros insists that anything beyond these core aspects is merely a diversion from these fundamental truths. She maintains multiple connections to the mortal realm, where her devoted adherents toil within torture chapels dedicated in her name. Vevelor. Similar to Kakaiton, Vevelor embarked on his mortal journey before ascending to demagogue status. However, Vevelor's existence predates even the Stitch Weavers, with his mortal history stretching so far back that he achieved his position of demagogue prior to the chaining of the Velstrax in Hell. Vevelor stood by Agrigus's side when the latter led the Velstrax to the Shadow Plane, and this allegiance has endured, garnering Agrigus's favor. Vevelor governs a dominion on the Shadow Plane known as Cliff Grip, positioned at the edge of an immense chasm called the Deeping Darkness. The Deeping Darkness holds significance for the worshippers of Zonkuthon, as it was from this abyss that the Midnight Lord emerged into Galarian upon gaining freedom from his own captivity. Similarly, Vevelor concentrates on amassing devotees in Nidal, capitalizing on a rich pool of followers in the imposing Hall of Broken Dreams near Ridwan. Vevelor's cult in Nidal treads a perilous path, for its message of emancipation through self-determination contradicts the Kuthite doctrine of deriving joy from servitude. Despite the risk, Vevelor's cult has skillfully concealed its more subversive tenets, earning a tacit nod from Nadal's authorities, although not official approval. Vevelor's desire is to share his path of ascension with others, yet he remains indifferent to whether his disciples genuinely seek their own transformation. Amid the echoing screams of agony within Cliff Grip, Vevelor's comforting assurances reverberate, promising exaltation beyond the ordeal. 